Well, grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, since Jesus' baptism last week, where the Holy Spirit descends upon him and God proclaims Jesus as God's beloved Son, well, the writer um, of Luke takes this short detour down genealogy lane. He, his list starts with Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, and then goes way back to the beginning with Adam, the son of God. Well, this reminds us that Jesus was from a long line of good Jewish stock. Well, after his baptism, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, where he spent 40 days in the desert tempted by God, or tempted, excuse me, tempted by the devil. Well, these 40 days alludes to the 40 years the Israelites had spent in the wilderness after their freedom from slavery under the Pharaoh in Egypt. So after the 40 days, when the devil had finished every test, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. Well, after these temptations, Jesus is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what gives him this wisdom and authority in his preaching and teaching. So, of course, that starts attracting crowds. Well, Jesus, as a child, regularly attended temple services. He attended religious festivals like Passover. And there was this one incident when he was 12 years old where he stayed behind uh, when his fam after his family had left to make that long trip home. His parents were unaware that he wasn't in this traveling group. So after searching, they found him in the temple. Well, Jesus, even at a young age, listened to the synagogue teachers and asked intelligent questions. At age 12, the elders were amazed at his understanding. Jesus learned and he knew his scripture. As Luke states it, Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. So Jesus' first public sermon, or as my study Bible uh, titles it, the inaugural announcement, is at the invitation of his hometown synagogue. Common practice was for the guest preacher to select the and read the scripture and then comment on it. So Jesus did. Well, the locals were quite proud of their Jesus. What gracious things he said, what wonderful scripture he quoted, until, until Jesus continues to quote some of the judgment against Israel. The prophets Elijah and Elisha proclaimed judgment on Israel and instead turned to Gentiles, the foreigners. So even though Jesus began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, it doesn't mean it was accepted. Even though God keeps reaching out to non-Jews through his inclusive love, it doesn't mean Jews or Gentiles accept him. Well, the Jews react with rage. Their ears burned. What do you do with a prophet who preaches what you don't want to hear, even if it's your hometown favorite son? Run him out of town at the least, though killing him would be permanent and following the law. You see, Deuteronomy states the seriousness of heresy. Then the Lord replied to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my, my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Well, Luke, in his artful storytelling style, foreshadows what is to come. There's the importance of the temple, the friction of who is in 
and who is out. God's preference to the poor, the outsiders, the ignored. God's mission to the non-Jews, the Gentiles, the foreigners. And Jesus' mission to follow the spirit of the law instead of the letter of the law. Well, this, of course, puts Jesus at odds with the Jewish government and the religious leaders. They will succeed at killing him by crucifixion. But we know from this side of history that they will fail at keeping him dead because Jesus is resurrected. Well, today in our story, Jesus is just beginning his public ministry. He is drenched and empowered by the Holy Spirit. His ministry on earth has this threefold focus, a ministry of restoration that frees and heals the afflicted, a ministry that insists on table fellowship with sinners, and a ministry of calling and training his disciples. Well, what surprises me in this story today is how quickly that changes from admiration to violent opposition. How quickly the hometown people forget the details of Jesus' miraculous birth. How eager they were here, ready to hear God's word until they did hear God's word. But we are no different. We quickly forget about the miraculous birth of Jesus and put it away with our Christmas decorations kept safely until next year. There's times when God's word, whether it comes to us in the written word of scripture, as Jesus, the word made flesh that comes to us in the bread and wine of Holy Communion, or the word in song or preached, no matter how the word comes to us, there's times when we are disturbed. We are confronted with truth that we'd rather not hear. Surprised? Our ears too burn with rage. And always, always, we are surprised by God's grace. Grace found in forgiveness, Grace found in Jesus sharing himself in the bread and wine. Grace when we don't deserve it, ask for it, or even expect it. Episcopalian priest L. William Countryman describes this confusion of voices and the surprise of grace in his poem, A Voice in the Static. Your words are hard to decipher. Your voice submerged in the static of chattering minds and hearts is hard to hear. Above all, for us, the pious, trying so hard to listen. Jesus was never more of a problem than for us who knew God best, who read the scriptures and taught the rest to know their sins. The more confidence, the more static. Better to confess with Solomon that finally we do not know. Confessing our ignorance, we make room for friendship. We affirm beyond our understanding. When Jesus brought good news, he said, turn and believe. What does it take to believe good news? Turning away from despair, from fear and foreboding, surrender of self-confidence, the opening of the hand to receive goodness, the triumph of thanksgiving over dread. Grace can only come as a surprise. And when grace comes, it confuses us all our accounts, all that time spent with the double entry columns of our merits and our sins, all swept away. All that deliberation, the slow building of confident theologies, all shattered. Yet not all wasted. Lying among the fragments, we find, like Paul, the neglected words that could have pointed us toward the forgotten possibility, to a knowledge of you that admits we do not know, a heart willing 
to accept surprise. Turn and believe the good news. Your good news does not amend our knowledge of you. It upends it till every element of it, shaken loose and free fall, rearrange itself to form a picture we recognize and yet could not have drawn before. Turn and believe. There is no hearing of your voice that does not transform and no single hearing that transforms once and for all. Always some static remains blurring the voice we hear. Grace, even when we have known it many times before, will still find ways to surprise. Its music penetrates the gavel and we are astonished and we are changed. Amen.